So I will, yeah, introduce our project, Isoperm. Um, but just before I start, as with all these things, science never happens with a vacuum, you know this. So I need to just give a bit of a shout out to the rest of our team here at Northumbria. My PI, Seb Breitenbach, Ola Quitchin, our two wonderful PhD students, Jade Robinson and Maria Box, and Sevi Modesto, our lab manager, uh, clumped isotope expert and all-round YSE guru. Um, we're an international project as well, so we've got partners in five uh, different countries. We work mainly with the Alfred Weniger Institute in Potsdam, in Germany, but we've got um, colleagues as well in Russia and in Israel and the US. So without further ado, well, I should say as well, if you want to contact me, if you don't fancy asking a question in the seminar, my email address is up on screen. You can tweet me and I'll leave that uh, website address, isoperm.net, down at the bottom right hand corner of shameless self-promotion throughout the talk. So I've got about 45 minutes, 50 minutes with you. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about what permafrost is, uh, why it's important, why we want to study it, um, particularly in the past. A little bit about sort of analyses that isoperm are doing and how that analysis is helping us better understand permafrost and environmental drivers on permafrost change. And then I should probably show you some data. So I'll show you some preliminary findings from a late Miocene period called the Tortolian up in the high Arctic. And that's some data that we're hoping to push out to publication in the next couple of weeks. So what is permafrost? Well, it's defined as soil or an other superficial deposit, even bedrock, that remains frozen for two consecutive years. And it covers vast swathes of the Northern Hemisphere. About 15% of the Arctic and subarctic is covered in permafrost. And you can see we can divide it into continuous and discontinuous, this diagram on the right-hand side, with the continuous permafrost being more uh, thorough coverage and discontinuous, more sporadic coverage. But the reason that we're interested in permafrost is because it's an absolutely vast carbon store. It contains about double the amount of carbon that we find in the modern atmosphere. So again, as I was saying, we can divide up into three different, four different types of permafrost. Our continuous permafrost, where we have almost continuous coverage of frozen ground, decreasing down through discontinuous, 50 to 90% coverage, and then sporadic or isolated, where we have uh, 10 to 50% of the ground being frozen. And this is a study from the North American continent. Uh, as we move from our sort of 55 degree latitudes up to the high latitudes, about 17 degrees. And you can see our active layer. So this is a thin layer on top of the permafrost that thaws and freezes every year where we might have some biological activity going on. That thins the further north we go. And we move from south to north from this sporadic, uh, less continuous permafrost into much, much deeper, much more widely covered permafrost up in the north where it's much colder, as you might expect. Now, we all know that permafrost is beginning to degrade. This is what we call a permafrost thaw slump. So what's happening here is the land in front of this vast wall has thawed and loses volume and it collapses down. That's exposing the wall behind it. That's now exposed to the elements, to the warm atmosphere. And again, that starts to thaw much, much faster. And the same thing will happen. And this will progressively move back um, faster and faster. Just to put some scale onto this. That's one of my colleagues down the bottom there. This is absolutely vast. This is the biggest permafrost thaw slump uh, in the world called the Batagai Mega Slump. It's found in central Siberia. It's one of our study sites. It's over two kilometers long, about 100 meters in height. And it's known by the locals as the gateway to the underworld. So this isn't just happening in Siberia. We're monitoring it all over the world. We've got some Landsat data from Banks Island up in northern Canada here. Um, we're comparing 1984 with 2013 in these images at the bottom. In 1984, we have about 63 of these thaw slumps registered. By 2013, we're getting about 4,000 of them. So we know that permafrost is thawing very, very fast. And we can also measure it by looking at things like greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a study that came out a few years ago, looking at methane emissions um, from methane hydrates. So this is where you have methane trapped within an ice crystal. And this is essentially what we're looking at here. Each of these images is a time series, a shot over northern Siberia. And the data that we're seeing is looking at methane emissions. 
So if we go from the top left, we're looking at May 2020, moving forward month by month down to the bottom right, where we're looking at May 2021. So we've got a year's worth of data here. And during that summer of 2020, Northern Siberia went through an extreme heat wave. Temperatures were about six degrees warmer than the usual average. And we saw around the summer the emergence of these red bands. So these are methane emissions, me, uh, emissions from those methane hydrates as a permafrost starts to thaw and release its greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So we can also see um, uh, permafrost thaw happening in these other ways as well. I just wanted to stress as well, it's not just temperature that controls permafrost thaw. Precipitation dynamics, snow cover, seasonality all play a role as well. And it's not particularly well understood. And that's one of the things that we want to try and do with our isoperm project. We want to try to understand well, what are the environmental drivers of Siberian permafrost thaw. So this is a study from uh, Canada at the Peel Plateau. Got two thaw slumps here, the top and bottom um, graphs that you can see. Again, it's another time series. We've got about two months worth of data going from June 2012 to August 2012. Uh, the black wiggly line here is temperature. The gray wiggly line is what we call our sediment transport index, essentially a measure of how much sediment is being transported out of these thaw slumps. And our blue bar chart here is precipitation. And you can see that after each precipitation event, we end up with quite a dramatic increase in our sediment transport index. So after each rainfall event, huge amount of sediment transported out of these thaw slumps. And the theory is that the precipitation is uh, moving down to the thaw slump, mobilizing the sediment, causing increased permafrost thaw, and we're seeing increased rates of slumping. So this causes absolutely all sorts of local problems. Um, obvious one being subsidence, image from Northern Canada where the permafrost under this building was thawed and the grounds collapsed down. I was traveling through um, Siberia about two years ago and the roads there are an absolute nightmare to drive on bumping up and down where the permafrost underneath it is thawed. So all sorts of problems with local infrastructure. The IPCC estimates about 70% of our Arctic infrastructure is located in regions at risk from permafrost thaw. But it's not just infrastructure. It's affecting local communities too. So I was lucky enough to see a talk from a community leader from Nunavut a few years ago. And he was explaining how their society is very hierarchical. So community elders are promoted based partly on their local knowledge highly respected and one of the things that is very beneficial is the knowledge of the local landscape it's a dangerous landscape so if you have knowledge of safe passages through that landscape it's respected and you become be promoted up within that society he was saying that as the landscape is changing so quickly all of that knowledge is suddenly being invalidated it's useless and that's changing those long established long held community dynamics but I guess what we're really interested in is this permafrost tipping point that you've probably heard of. So on the left there, we can see a map of what we call the Yodoma. The Yodoma is organic rich, very old permafrost. It contains an awful lot of carbon. And as the planet's warming up, we made a lovely schematic here for you on the right. We produced these for the Pages Horizon issue a few years ago. Um, the active layer is deepening. We're seeing the permafrost in the top layers thawing, that increases microbial activity, breaks down that organic matter that's been held up for tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, and releases that carbon into the atmosphere. So we end up with our classic uh, permafrost feedback loop with our anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, causing anthropogenic warming. That causes permafrost thaw, releases further greenhouse gases, and causes further atmospheric warming. And we end up in this positive feedback cycle. So permafrost collapse was recognized as one of the sort of key tipping elements um, around the globe uh, a few years ago. This is a publication uh, in Nature from Tim Lenton, alongside things like collapse of the thermohaline circulation, Amazon rainforest dieback. And more recently, uh, this is a Guardian graphic based on data from a paper that came out last year. 
uh, looking at different tipping points and when we're likely to surpass them. And you can see we've lined up all our different tipping points. Our permafrost thaw is the fourth one down there with a big blue arrow pointing towards it. And we look at, well, what's the likely temperature at which we're likely to pass? We've got our potential temperature range in the red bar, most likely point to pass in the red dot. And you can see that this is a tipping point we're likely to surpass very, very soon, potentially at levels of warming below those UN emissions temperature targets of 1.5 degrees. So we really want to try and understand it a little bit better. Uh, hope we can justify that to you. Uh, the problem is that we don't really understand permafrost thaw very well at all. So this is a graph from the IPCC special report on ocean and the cryosphere. It was released a few years ago. And this shows permafrost thaw extent given different emission scenarios. So working from our low emission scenario, RTP 2.6 in blue, up into our high emission scenario, RTP 8.5 in red. You can see there's obviously a huge difference in thaw extent based on the scenario, but even within those scenarios, the range in potential thaw extent is absolutely enormous. So in our low emission scenario, somewhere between 2 and 60% of total permafrost area thawed, and in our high emission scenario, somewhere between 30 and 99%. Absolutely vast error bars on it. So how are you meant to then predict what sort of emissions we're going to see. The reason that this is so poorly constrained is because we really don't understand very well what the environmental drivers of permafrost thought are. It's more than just temperature. So just to sort of drive this point home um, about how poor our understanding of permafrost thaw and in subsequent emissions are, we don't actually, because our understanding is so poor, we don't um, include estimations of emissions from permafrost thaw in our IPCC emissions targets. So we have our so-called emissions budget, the amount of uh, greenhouse gases we can emit to stay below a certain temperature target. Those do not consider emissions or future emissions from permafrost thaw. So this study was a modeling study that attempted to do that. And you can see on the uh, x-axis here, we've got different temperature targets. And these different colored lines here essentially represent different temperature scenarios, whether or not we manage to avoid, exceed these different temperature targets. But the one I want you to just pay attention to are these turquoise diamonds here. These turquoise diamonds represent the 50-50 chance of avoiding a particular temperature. And if we look at a 1.5 degree temperature target, we can see that that reduces the amount of emissions, amount of permissible emissions uh, under anthropogenic emissions by between 60 to 80 gigatons. And if we put that into percentage terms on the right hand side here, we're looking at about 30% reduction in the amount of carbon that the world can emit if we want to stay below our 1.5 degree temperature target. So we really, as a project, want to try and understand well, what are the environmental drivers of permafrost thaw and how can we use that to better inform how permafrost is going to change in the future. So this is our key scientific question. Can past permafrost formation and degradation be attributed to specific temperature or precipitation thresholds and seasonality patterns? And we do this, as you might imagine, with the Paleo Climate Society by looking back in time. And our archive of choice is cave deposits, speleothems, stalagmites, stalactites, flowstones, and everything in between. So calcite deposits in caves. And the reason that we can use these is because they only form from liquid drip waters. So where you have dripping water, you have speleothem formation. And you can imagine that when you have permafrost around your cave, maybe in a historical cold period, and they get permafrost expansion, all of that water is locked up into the permafrost and it can no longer penetrate into the cave. And so we don't get speleothem formation. So we can date our speleothems and we can use them to build a chronology of permafrost degradation and um, expansion in the past. And this isn't really a new idea. So this is um, 
study from 1989 done by some of your colleagues, Matthew, down at UEA and a few others, uh, which attempted to use this idea of dating speleothem to build up a chronology of the British ice sheets. And this goes back 1989, nearly 30 years, over 30 years, God, that's depressing, um, to uh, of this sort of research ongoing. So about 10 years ago, one of our members of our project, Anton Vax, picked up this idea and decided to apply it in Siberia. And he looked at three caves. So going from south to north here on our map on the left-hand side, you can see Okochimichka, which is uh, around sort of 52 degrees north, moving up to Botovskaya Cave, about 55 degrees north, and then Lenskaya Cave at about 60 degrees north. And all he did was date these speleothems and look at when, use that to build up when permafrost had thawed in the past. And you can see the results on the right hand side. So each of these points represents a different date, date of a speleothem, with the green at Okochi Niche Cave further south, the sort of bluey purple here at Botovskaya Cave, and then the sort of pinky color up here at Lenskaya Cave. Now, what's fun to notice here is that Lenskaya Cave only saw permafrost retreat all the way back in MIS 11. So he noticed, I should say, that each period of speleothem formation and therefore each period of permafrost thaw aligned very nicely with our interglacial episodes, which is what you'd expect, right? Warm episodes, permafrost thaw, speleothem formation. And yes, Lenskaya Cave up here at about 60 degrees north, saw permafrost thaw and speleothem formation during MIS 11. And MIS 11 is one of these so-called super interglacials. We had global average temperatures about 1.5 degrees warmer than the modern day. So what that's telling us is that with temperature rises about 1.5 degrees above modern, that's enough to see permafrost thaw up to 60 degrees of latitude. Now, a few years ago, this was taken one step further. So with the advent of uh, uranium lead dating, we can now take speleothem dates much, much further back in time. Previously, it was based on uranium thorium dating, um, which can go back maybe about half a million years. We can now go back much, much further. And actually, what you can now see, again, we've got the same colours, so bottom sky in the blue, then sky in the purple. And we can see that actually speleothem formation was relatively common at Lenskaya sky up until about 400,000 years ago. So it might not necessarily be a case of it happened to be a particularly hot interglacial, maybe something else is going on. And Anton put this down to about 400,000 years ago being the onset of perennial Arctic sea ice. So about 400,000 years ago was when the Arctic ice cap had expanded sufficiently, but it remained there over summer. And what that did is it cut off a key moisture source for central Siberia. So over summer, when there was no ice cap, you'd see a lot of evaporation up over the Arctic Ocean. That moisture would move south, where it would precipitate out, and it would destabilize permafrost, and you'd get speleothem formation cut off that moisture source and we therefore uh, allow our permafrost to survive through the interglacial periods. So again, it's showing it's more than just temperature that's affecting our permafrost stability. And that's what Isoperm wants to try and do. We are trying to go beyond just the dating and we're trying to use our speleothems to pull out well, what were the environmental conditions during these periods of permafrost thaw. So I have to show some obligatory holiday snaps. This is our, well, couple of photos from our recent field work. I also get a chance to show the team. So this is the very, very cold looking picture there, our bot of Skya cave site. So down uh, just north of Lake Baikal. And we actually, we have to get out there over the winter because to access it, um, we drive over the river lane, it freezes over in winter. So it allows us much, much easier access to the cave site. Trust me, I'd much rather be going in the summer. It's very, very cold. So just to point out a few of our team members, top left, we've got Seth Brighton back. Uh, right in the middle, that's me looking cold. 
And then our two PhD students on the right hand side at the top right, that's Maria Box doing some field work recently in Mongolia. And the bottom right, smiling there in her natural habitat is uh, Jade Robinson. So these are our study sites. Um, we've got uh, permafrost study sites in the Black Diamonds. I'll explain a little bit more about those later. Now our cave study sites are these big orange dots. And what we were trying to do is build up a north-south transect up from Tamabastak on the coast of the Laptev Sea, all the way down to Okochi Nitschka Cave, uh, at the southern extent of Lake Baikal. By doing so, we hope to be able to look at the spatial evolution of permafrost over time. Uh, we were out at Botovskaya just as the current situation in Ukraine kicked off. So it's a bit of a shame. We had to um, get out of the country quite quickly. And as you can imagine, we haven't been able to get back. Um, we hoped to be able to penetrate further north into central Siberia, uh, back to Lenskaya, and then look for caves between Lenskaya and Tababastat that we could use to fill in our transect, if you like. Obviously, we can't do that. And we've been working with our funders who have been absolutely fantastic. And they've been happy for us to kind of adapt our plans a little bit. And instead of heading further north, what we've had to do is go further south into northern Mongolia. So you can see, zoomed in on the right hand side, some of our new cave sites there uh, on the banks of Lake Hovsgol in the north of Mongolia. Uh, and I actually think it's been a bit of a blessing in disguise because if I overlay that with a map of permafrost extent, where we can see, so the darker colours here represent our continuous permafrost, more than 90% of the land is frozen, moving down for the lighter colours for our discontinuous and sporadic and isolated permafrost. And you can see on the right hand side map here, our Mongolian um, sites are right at the southerly extent of continuous permafrost. So this is some of the most vulnerable permafrost in the world. So understanding what happens here, and it's very relevant to our very near future, uh, but it also means that hopefully we're going to be able to re really recreate uh, permafrost dynamics in quite fine high resolution going forwards. So what kind of analyses are we using? Well, first and foremost, we're looking at clumped isotopes. I'll explain these very briefly because I know that um, they've, sort of, they've been around maybe 10, 15 years clumped isotopes, but they're still not hugely prevalent. There's a lot of new labs coming online in the last two or three years. And just to sort of, in case you don't use them, whereas conventional isotopes, we'd look at uh, the ratio of heavy to light isotopes, so your oxygen 18, oxygen 18 over oxygen 16. Clumped isotopes, what we do is we look at how the heavy isotopes are arranged within the calcium carbonate lattice. And that's important because when we have two heavy isotopes bonded together, that's a low energy bond. So to represent that diagrammatically on the left here, this is the Morse potential of a hydrogen molecule. So the Morse potential is essentially just the energy contained within a covalent. And the different red lines here represent the different quantum states, so different vibrational states and frequencies. And if we zoom in on the bottom, the lowest energy state here, we can see there's a slight difference between a hydrogen atom, so two light sorry, hydrogen molecules, so two light hydrogen isotopes bonded together, and a deuterium molecule, so two heavy hydrogen isotopes bonded together. And if you think about that a bit more colloquially, where we've got light isotopes bonded together, so here we use a CO2 molecule as our diagram, we've got oxygen 16, carbon 12 bonded together, two light isotopes, nice and light, easy to move, high vibrational frequency. So we get a lot of those promoted at high temperatures. Conversely, we've got two heavy isotopes bonded together, the heavy, slow vibrational frequency, low energy bond. So we get more low energy bonds promoted at lower temperatures. So we measure this much the same way as you would with a conventional stable isotope. We react our calcium carbonate or phosphoric acid to produce CO2. And where we have no heavy isotopes within our carbonate lattice, we produce CO2 with a carbon 12, and two oxygen 16, that's a mass 44. Where we have two heavy isotopes bonded together, so carbon-13, oxygen-18, we produce CO2 of mass-47. And we can look at the ratio of mass-47 to 44 and produce what we call our delta-47 value. So delta-018, we use in stable isotopes, we look at delta-47. This is my, my baby, my lover. This is Tony, our mass spectrometer. He's a new perspective. Um, 
he we have a I shouldn't call him a he he's not gendered um so we have it's connected to what we call a new car prep system it's an automated system we can load 50 samples into this press go and it will run for about four days um provided it all goes well uh we can produce delta 47 um to an external standard deviation of about 0 0.02 per mil so very very high precision measurements we're looking at here whereas like a conventional uh stabilized token might be looking to get below 0 0.01 through external standard deviation we're looking at 0 0.02 so very very high precision small sample sizes we get, we're measuring 350 micrograms we could actually get lower than that i have no need to at the moment uh, and if you want sort of one one and a half degree temperature precision we're looking at doing sort of 15 20 replica analyses so probably about five milligrams of sample in total so you can see if you're looking at something like four ams it's a lot of picking time uh measurement time is about two hours per replica uh and the beautiful thing if you do work in climate isotope analysis uh this instrument we don't have to apply a pressure baseline correction nor do we have to apply any linearity corrections which is something that traditionally has been applied a lot within clump isotope analysis so it's uh something obviously you don't you want to apply as few corrections as possible so what we can do we'll start to produce temperature calibrations where we look at uh what is a delta 47 value at known temperatures and measure carbon that's precipitated at known temperatures so cold temperatures up here in the top right give us high delta 47 values warm temperatures down here in the bottom left give us low delta 47 values and we can use this to measure our delta 47 value and work out what temperature at which a carbonate was precipitated i just wanted to say before i talk any more about applying clump to speleothem so speleothems traditionally have faced a bit of a bad rap in the clump isotope community because they tend to be precipitated um out of isotopic equilibrium so the process in which speleothems form by co2 degassing it's a kinetic process we end up with isotopic fractionation and that's bad for trying to infer temperatures it means it's very very difficult to infer temperatures so we've got around this by looking at subaqueous slowly precipitated carbonates and there's several studies out there by Mathieu de Horn, um, at etc looking and showing that when you look at these slowly precipitated carbonates they tend to give you temperatures which you, uh, and they tend to, reasonable temperatures and they tend to be precipitated in isotopic equilibrium so on the left here we've got an example of a cave pearl so these are formed underwater normally around sort of central uh, precipitate nuclei so if we cut this open we might find say a bit of grit or bedrock inside and the carbonate precipitates around the outside and on the right, we've got one of the most beautiful flowstones I have in my collection. And you can see it's got these nice geodes inside. Again, we think these are subaqueously precipitated and going to give us reasonable temperatures. So I think it's about time I started showing you guys a few results. Um, I'm going to take you on a journey back to the Tortonian. So between 11.6 and 7.2 million years ago in the late Miocene. And it's been proposed quite a lot as a suitable analogue for near future anthropogenic climate change, which is the reason a lot of us do paleoclimate research. So global average temperatures are probably about four degrees warmer than the modern day. So the sort of thing we might expect under our sort of high emissions business as usual scenarios before the end of the century. Uh, we had atmospheric CO2 concentrations about uh, up to about 600 ppm so again similar to what we might expect over the coming decades we have summer ice-free arctic what we might expect by mid-century uh, and also the tectonic plate to kind of reach pretty much their modern latitudes and that's quite useful for us because we don't have to do too many corrections to account for tectonic movements essentially so we've gone up to our Tababastak site, so way up in the high Arctic in northern Siberia. It sits right at the top end of terrestrial continuous permafrost. Um, and there's a modern mean annual temperature of about minus 12 degrees here. So we're talking very, very cold. So about five years ago, uh, my colleagues went out there and collected 14 speleothem samples. We dated them, well, 
Anton Vax has dated them. So incredibly high precision. And he's shown during the Tortonian, we had significant speleothem formation. So what we're showing here is that given four degrees of global average warming up in the high Arctic, we needed at least about 12 degrees of warming because we need to be around about zero degrees in order for permafrost to thaw and for speleothem formation to occur. So this is important because it allows us to quantify this sort of so-called Arctic amplification. So we're showing here, we're giving the minimum estimate of our Arctic amplification. We're showing that at four degrees of warming globally, we had 12 degrees of warming up in the high Siberian Arctic. And traditionally, climate models have really struggled to project Arctic amplification. So this is a, an ensemble study of the CMIP models doing hindcasts of Arctic amplification. So our red line here is our temperature measurements, the had uh measurements. From, and the black lines are um, ensemble means. So we've got the four best models here in the solid black line and the four worst in the dash line. And you can see that the models don't do a bad job of reconstructing measured arts amplification up until sort of the mid 90s, where we see this sudden jump in Arctic temperature, which isn't repeated in the models. So models are consistently under projected Arctic amplification. And these new estimates, giving us a minimum extent of Arctic amplification, can help hopefully inform some of this modeling. We've also used these estimates and we said, well, if we see a 12 degree temperature rise over the Eurasian continent, which is uh, at least suggested in the very high Arctic from the fact we have speleothem formation, and we overlay that of a map of our permafrost, well, which permafrost now becomes vulnerable to thaw? And we'd be able to identify different areas with essentially a back of the envelope calculation. And we know, uh, or we project that around five to 15% of this permafrost will start to thaw in the near future or, or over the, the next centuries, because it takes time for permafrost to thaw. And we also see a lot of carbon recycling as permafrost thaws. A lot of that uh, carbon releases and uptake by increased vegetation expansion, that kind of thing. But doing that back of the envelope calculation, we get somewhere between 67 and 237 petagrams of carbon potentially could be released given that minimum Arctic amplification that we see during the Tortone. So to put that into context, the IPCC say that if we want to stay below our 1.5 degree C temperature target, we can only emit 400 petagrams of carbon um, in total. So it's important just to say here that we're not saying that we need to take 237 petagrams off that 400 petagram total. This is uh, our 67 to 237 is emissions given four degrees of global, um, uh, global average warming. So if we were to stay at 1.5 degrees, obviously we would see much, much lower emissions than that. And somebody's actually done a much uh, better modeling study of this than we have very, very recently. This study came out last month um, and they coupled a paleoclimate model from the mid Pliocene warm period with a permafrost model and said, well, if we were given temperature rises of 7.2 degrees above pre-industrial in the Arctic, which is what they project for the mid Pliocene warm period, they project that we'll lose about 93% of our permafrost coverage. Now we're saying, actually, temperature rises, we're looking at temperature rises of around 14 degrees up in the high Arctic during the Tortonian. So much, much greater levels of warming. And given that, what we'd end up with is just a few areas of continuous permafrost up in northern Greenland here, the uh, northern extent of Canada and up in northern Siberia as well, so a huge impact on permafrost. 
But I said we wanted to take this just beyond the dating. So that's what I've been working on recently. And this is data that we're hoping to push out to publication in climates of the past early, in, early next year. And so we've selected four of those 14 samples that we felt looked like we had the best chance of getting uh, um, slowly precipitated isotopic equilibrium temperatures from. And we've measured them for clump isotope analysis. And those reveal formation temperature somewhere between six and 12 degrees, you can see it here on the red. So we've now gone from our minimum temperature, of zero degrees, notified just from the formation, just from the formation of speleothems alone, to higher temperatures. We're able to quantify them with our clumped isotope analysis. And so we're suggesting that given, say, four degrees of global average warming during the Tortonian, actually what we're seeing is Arctic temperatures around 12 degrees, between six and 12. So maybe up to 24 degrees of warming above the modern day, because it's currently about minus 12. And we've managed to back this up actually with some fluid inclusion temperatures. So you can see these on the right-hand side of this table here. And you can see our, our mean temperatures are around, again, 12 degrees. So we're seeing some consilience and agreement between our clump isotope temperature and our fluid inclusion temperature. Now, it's quite hard to find existing temperature estimates for the late Miocene at high latitudes. But just as luck would have it, two happen to exist quite close to our Tababastak site. So this is actually a Russian um, pollen study uh, from these two sites here, Omoloi, and this one, which I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Um, so they're only a few hundred kilometers from our Tababastak site. Again, pollen assemblage data suggests that during the late Miocene, you can see it on the map on the right here, this high point, we're seeing temperatures of around 13, 14 degrees. So actually in quite good agreement with the sort of temperatures that we're getting from our plant ice tape analysis. We've also done some high resolution stable isotopes. So we micro milled two of these samples. We managed to get about um, Six seven hundred data points from SDBB27 and about 200 from SDBB I1, these two samples. If we simply plot them up as a box plot, so the delta rho 18, we can see over the entire growth length, um, we get very, very negative values, so around minus 16, minus 17. But we can compare that with Holocene values from Botovskaya Cave, so much further south at about 55 degrees latitude. And we see that our Tortonian high latitude temp uh, isotope values are similar to our Holocene mid latitude um, uh, isotope values. So, again, lot of sky in the modern day, much more temperate climate, suggesting back in the Tortonian, Tababastak was much more temperate, uh, much more similar to the sort of conditions that we might find further south. We've also done some very high resolution close element analysis here. So we, this is laser ablation data done at um, 2.6 micron resolution, incredibly uh, technical stuff uh, done by some colleagues uh, in Australia, Pete Scott. Uh, so we analyzed about 15 different elements here and performed some principal component analysis on it just to look for common variability amongst our different elements. And you can see with our two samples at the top and bottom here, our uranium, strontium, and barium show similar co-variation in both samples. Uh, so if we plot them up on the right-hand side here as a time series, this is a five millimeter section of each sample. And we can see that we've got strontium-calcium ratios at the top, followed by magnesium and the green, barium in the pink, and uranium in the blue, that these show really interesting cycles up and down. Um, so there's a few things that can drive these sort of variations in speleothems, but the main one, these elements are associated with a phenomenon known as prior calcite precipitation, or PCP for short. It's exactly what it sounds like. So it's precipitation of calcite further upstream from our speleothem formation site. So the typical example is if we're looking at a stalagmite, so growing up from the floor, 
what we might see is where the drip water falls from the roof of the cave is stalactite formation above the stalagmite formation site. And that stalactite is an example of prior calcite precipitation. It's calcite being precipitated from your drip waters before those drip waters reach your uh, analytical formation site. And so when we see prior calcite precipitation, what we see is um, calcium ions being removed from our solution waters. And so that leaves behind a relative increase in the concentration of some of these trace elements of strontium, magnesium, and barium. Now, there's a few different things that can control prior calcite precipitation. Some of them are things like cave ventilation. But we argue that what we're seeing here is a hydrologically driven signal of wet versus dry conditions. And the reason we argue that is because of the covariation that we see with these two records down the bottom. So the purple is phosphorus and the orange here is copper. Now, these two elements are strongly associated with organic matter. So Adam Hartland in New Zealand's done some amazing work looking at how copper is binded to organic material and it's colloidally transported into caves where it's incorporated into speleothems. Same with phosphorus, where you have a lot of organic matter being flushed into caves, you see peaks in phosphorus concentrations. And so what we're set suggesting is where we see peaks in our copper and our phosphorus, you can see they're coincident. We're seeing a, huge, a, a large amount of infiltration into the cave. Now these peaks coincide with troughs in our PCP indicator elements. So again, where we see wet conditions, we see a reduction in PCP. So we see um, reduced strontium barium uh, ratios and then under dry conditions that the trend reverses so we see this increase in strontium bearing concentrations and a corresponding decrease in our phosphorus and copper so we want to argue that these are seasonal cycles so if we perform some spectral analysis on this and if we assume that these are annual cycles we see cycle lengths of about 200 microns in STBB27, and about 300 microns in STBB I1. Now those are fairly high growth rates, but they're similar to the sort of things that you might see in modern sort of temperate conditions. And we can back this up a little bit by looking at annual banding in the speleothem. So 27 here exhibits really, really nice annual banding. So you can see the layers here and we can analyze the annual banding by looking um, at what we call the grayscale. So essentially, we can draw a line across the growth axis of our speleothem. We can look at the amount of light or reflected off of it, which is the grayscale. And this fluctuates up and down with the annual banding, where we see an annual lamination, we see a higher, uh, a higher grayscale value. And if we can align our grayscale values with our strontium calcium values, which we do in this plot here, we can see that these peaks align. We see coincidental peaks in both the grayscale and our trace element record. So we're suggesting that the fluctuation trace element records align with our annual banding. And what we're seeing here is really, really strong hydrological seasonality. So back in the Tortonian, much, much warmer temperatures, potentially up to 24 degrees warmer in the, in the Arctic than the modern day, and a highly seasonal environment. So what next for isotherm? Well, we're looking at a few other proxies. So I'm applying clumped isotope analysis to um, ostracods. It takes an awful lot of microscope time. But we want to do this because ostracods and permafrost areas tend to proliferate in what we call polygonal pools. So over summer, this is some pictures of polygonal pools on the right hand side. The active layer thaws. We see the development of these temporary pools in which ostracods proliferate. Then over winter, these freeze up again. Ostracods die and get trapped in the sediment. So, what I can do is I can extract the ostracods. We can get temperatures from them. And we can use this as a way to deduce summer temperatures. And then we can then start to look at things like seasonality and get mean annual temperatures 
from our Spenia Thames. And we can compare with the summer temperatures from our ostracods. Uh, we're also measuring um, isotopes within the permafrost waters themselves, or permafrost ice, if you will. So here, this is conducted mainly by our colleagues at the Alfred Venegar Institute. And again, we're using this to look at seasonality. So we have two types of permafrost here on the screen. On the left-hand side, we've got ice wedges. And these are kind of classic freeze-fall weathering, if you like. During the sort of spring months, just coming off the back of the cold season, we see meltwaters entering into frost cracks. Obviously, they freeze, they expand, open our frost cracks, and over and over time, we end up with this huge ice wedge, and we can draw a transect from the centre to the outer edges of this uh, ice wedge. And we can then measure the isotopes, we can essentially produce a chronology of spring cold season precipitation. We also have intra-sedimental ice, another type of permafrost. It's exactly what it sounds like with frozen water between the sediment. And this tends to reflect summer temperatures. So we need liquid precipitation to seep down into that top layer where it freezes. And again, we can extract this and we can look at uh, Delta 18 signals in summer precipitation. We can use this to historically build up an idea of uh, precipitation seasonality. We're also trying to look at some relatively novel proxies. So we've recently um, developed a method for extracting pollen from speleothems in our lab. So this is something that a few other labs have done and we've tried to recreate. Uh, so I was very excited to see on screen that some, uh, some myosine pollen. The palynologists on the call might tell me something different, but I believe that's a bit of pine. And we've extracted this from our Tabobastac speleothems. So it's quite exciting because today, Tabobastac is several hundred kilometers north of the tree line. So this is suggesting, I know pollen can travel long distances, uh, wind transported, but it's suggesting that potentially the tree line expanded north. And by looking at the different types of pollen, it can tell us a little bit about the types of vegetation. Unfortunately, concentrations of pollen in speleothems is very low. So we're looking at dissolving up 400, 500 grams of speleothem carbonate to maybe get 40, 50 pollen specimens. So we're never going to really be able to get enough to build an entire assemblage, but it can give us an idea of the sort of vegetation that might have been there. And we're working really, well, we're currently producing these records, but we're working on, well, how do we actually interpret these? How can we confirm that they're not windblown, et cetera? We're also looking at, well, one of the ways that we can do that is by looking at what we call lignin oxidation products. So I should give some credit to my colleague, Jade Robinson, who's produced this beautiful plot on the right hand side here. Now, lignans are biomarkers uh, produced by plants and different types of plants produce different types of lignans. So we have three different types that we analyze. So we've got the uh, syringal, vanil, and cinnamon types. And different types of vegetation produce these biomarkers in different ratios. So, they are leached out of vegetation, they drip down into our cave, and they're incorporated into our speleothem. So what we can do is we can extract them from the speleothem. We then oxidize them to produce what's called a lignin oxidation product. And then we can look at these ratios of different lignans to tell us well, what was the likely vegetation during this period of speleothem formation. So this is some early data. This is produced, I should name check actually, our colleagues at the University of Mainz. So I think Julia Homan has produced this data itself uh, alongside Jade Robinson. Um, and Jade's been looking at, this is from our Botoskaya cave site, the differences in vegetation between the last interglacial and the Holocene. So the Holocene are these orange uh, data points and last interglacial being the blue data points. And you can see but between the last and the Holocene, we've seen a shift towards woody vegetation. Uh, and we're doing this as well with some of our Tabobastax speleothems. And we're finding, um, similar to what we're seeing in the pollen, find lots of woody conifer forest suggested type of lignans up there. So again, it can back up our pollen evidence. We can use this to look at what the different types of vegetation are. Finally, 
probably save my worst slide till last here. Um, we're looking at a molecule called levoglucosan. So levoglucosan is produced solely in the combustion of cellulose. So we can use it as a proxy for forest fire prevalence and forest fire magnitude. So it's uh, when vegetation burns, it's released up into the air, falls above our cave, transported through the epicast, incorporated into our speleothem. Again, if we analyze time series on our speleothem, we can look at how uh, forest fire prevalence has changed in the past. So I think I'm gonna leave it there. I think that's given you a little introduction to uh, the Isoperm project. Uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, feel free to ask any questions. If I can answer them, I will. <laughs>